Hey everybody, my name is Axel Villamils. It's 24 Shades of Blue. Welcome to episode three of the podcast. We have the amazing Dan Ramos, troop coordinator. He's also the crime prevention coordinator and the constable that you all love and see on Twitter with the beard. So Dan, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks a lot for having me. No, yeah, no problem. Um, the first thing, you know, I heard from everybody is, you know, he has this wicked beard and I can already see it right now. It's shaped. <laughs> Clearly you're okay with COVID and getting it all cleaned up. So you <laughs> don't have right. the crazy hair. The hair for me is getting crazy, but, um, why, you know, your Twitter handle is actually beard and protect. you know, let's talk about that identity. I would love to know about it. Yeah, it was, um, it started uh, more out of laziness. Um, I was, I, you know, as I grew up, I, I didn't want to sh shave every day. So uh, I was in the army in the reserves uh, at the time as a kid. I couldn't grow a beard very well, but shaved every day. And then, uh, you know, got into policing and, and they allowed for beards. So so I let it grow and uh, I, I enjoy it. My my wife really likes beards. So she's the she's the main reason why it's allowed to stay. Um, Me too. And then with with policing, you know, traditionally, you um, beards and facial hair isn't isn't really allowed so it was fun to to grow it as a recruit and and sort of get some some heckling from some of the sergeants and, and staff sergeants you know what i mean and and they're on me to make sure that you know it's it's within ranks yeah. it can't be too long it has to be trimmed i didn't and all know that. that i didn't know that yeah. at all that's the thing that you're not allowed to have you know crazy crazy like out of the way beard is that a safety thing or is that just more to keep in you know for, for the uniform and, and things like that that's it's a great question um I, i'm not sure why but it is a procedure so okay. and it's yeah specific lengths you know it's two and a half centimeters one inch long it's got to be a full beard there's all kinds of, of regs around it so it's uh i mean now it's become more accepted uh throughout <laughs> the service a lot of a lot of people have it but but I like it. I enjoy it. And so I kind of took that that identity on as the beard and protect guy. Well, yeah. shout out to all the police officers with beards out there, keeping it clean <laughs> and giving that style, new age style. I'm with it. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's great. I, I, I want to actually get right into um, this thing that I saw in your title on LinkedIn, which was uh, the troop coordinator. And, you know, from the civilian side, I'm like, oh, troop, you know, I, I thought army type of style, but then, you know, you actually looked it up and I researched about it and it was, you know, something I never knew existed, but would love for you to explain it to, to everybody that's listening. Yeah, absolutely. Troop is an acronym. It stands for the Toronto Recreational Outreach Outtripping Program. And what it is, is we get youth uh, to come out and camp with us, basically. So it's a, a free program funded entirely by ProAction Cops and Kids. Uh, they're a charitable organization that funds events and programs uh, like that, like all sorts of things for police officers to get involved with uh, community members. So what we do is we go out in, into the community and we get those community members, um, those that either for reasons of, of poverty or circumstance have not been out camping. Um, and, and same thing, not necessarily had a great relationship with police officers. And we say, hey, let's let's go on out and uh, and camp together in Algonquin Park. So we'll do we'll do four or five day trips out there where we're camping, we teach them um, paddling some canoe skills. They get a, a basic level one uh, ORCA certification, which is provincially recognized, the Ontario Recreational Canoeing and Kayaking Association. So they get qualified there. I'm a qualified instructor. And um, what better way to, to build bridges and and, uh, and and create relationships than when you're out in the middle of nowhere with the, the concern of black bears around, you know, yeah. uh, we got to put our food away. We got to keep the campsite clean. Let's go out and paddle. And um, you know what I mean? And then everybody's like, well, I've never done this before. And like, yeah, this is great. Sometimes the cops haven't done it. Sometimes the youth haven't done it. And we're, we're getting together. That's and one awesome. of my favorite parts. Yeah. One thing I will say, my favorite part in the whole program is uh, about halfway. We, uh, we've got a couple days. We're starting to get to know each other on a more personal level. Um, and then we go out and we actually take them to ice cream. And so it's, a, it's like a little bit of home. You know, yeah. we've been in the outhouses. We've had no electricity. You know, we've been sleeping on the floor in the cold, in the rain, in the mud. And then we take them out and we go for ice cream. And when we go for ice cream, we sit down at the picnic table. And then that's when we do something called ask a cop anything. Okay. And so we get these youth, like, ask me anything. You have concerns with something that has happened to you or to a friend or something, ask me and, and, and we'll talk about it and we can reason. And then they, they, they show us their side of it. Um, we show us our side of it, right? And there's, there's a lot of coming together. And I've seen those conversations go well beyond the ice cream into the night where it's I'm dark sure. again, right? 
and they're, they're there by the campfire and there's officers and youth and they're coming together and they're talking and they're working things out. And it's, it's fantastic. Are you ever so. shocked by, you know, or, or really thrown off guard by the questions that, you know, come out of the used mouths when they get into that, you know, ask a cop anything, are you ever thrown off or, you know, does it make you think totally differently uh, with those questions? Not anymore. <laughs> uh, the first few questions uh, that we always get out of the way with, with every kid that asks is, hey, have you ever shot anybody? You know, have you ever arrested somebody? So we get through those. All right. That's, that's the first thing on everybody's mind. And then we get into those deep questions and um, everybody's got the same same concerns. Right. It's It's always it is a matter of trust quite often. And things that they've seen happen that they don't think was right. And so so we discuss. And sometimes it's like maybe the officers could have done a little better. Yeah. Or, or maybe they weren't acting, uh, you know, entirely in, in our procedure or something like that. But oftentimes it's just educating them on what the law is and what our rights are and our duty to to protect them. Right. And uh, and it goes back and forth. And I think, they, I think that's know. so important, though. You know, um, first off, this is a great initiative. I have no idea this existed. I think more people need to know. Um, and we'll go into later on how we can actually get in, you know, if anybody's interested, how that happens. But I think more of these conversations need to happen. You know, it, you're right. It's a trust thing. Um, you know, I, I talk about trust a lot in in a lot of industries. You're not going to get hired for something if they don't trust you, you know, like I will go in debt with like millions of dollars and give it to Steven Spielberg and trust that he'll create a good movie. You know, I'm not going to give right. it to Joe Blow over there who I, have, I know nothing about or I've seen already bad things about, you know, why would I trust them? So I think it's that communication, which I see that you guys are trying to build, you know, more and more with everybody every day. And um, I, I find that so important. So, you know, great, yeah. great stuff on that. But yeah, how, how do people, you know, for youth that are listening, how do they get involved if they want to do this? Yeah, they can um, contact me, uh, my email, my Twitter account. Uh, a lot of officers, I've got a number of officers that uh, are connected throughout the city that, that get the youth. So um, the easiest way to get um, connected directly with ProAction is to uh, is to email me or to hit me up on Twitter or Facebook uh, at Beard, Beard and Protect, Dan Ramos. Um, Beard and Protect, uh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah, everybody, please tweet him. Um, thank you for sharing the podcast, by the way. I saw uh, Dan sharing it as I'm creeping him to make sure I'm ready for this interview. So <laughs> it worked I out. I had to do the same, right? I had to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate it. And, and, and I hope you found good stuff if you creep me. So um, I, hopefully always good stuff. Um, but, you know, you, you do have another title, which is crime prevention coordinator. And I mean, as of right now, I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things that a lot of people have on their mind. We're going into lockdown number two. It's freezing and cold. So everybody's stuck inside and getting bored. Um, and I'm sure, you know, um, people are going to start to get antsy and, and and do things. So I want to ask you, have you noticed, you know, a rise in, in deaths during the COVID climate, especially during more of a lockdown environment? Yeah, the I mean the the break-ins that that I've seen on on our open open data stuff is uh, there's been a reduce in residential uh, break-ins, but as far as thefts go, absolutely. The the one thing that that coronavirus has, has made us do in the whole lockdown is a lot of online shopping, yeah. and we see those those package thefts. Uh, we call them porch pirates. Uh, you know, it's a common <laughs> term. Those, those those porch pirates are around at, at Christmas and the holiday season, right? But with coronavirus, it was it was even more so. There, you know, because everybody was ordering online and ordering everything that they needed. So those thefts uh, definitely have gone up. Wow. And, and yeah, and it'll continue to go up because now we're in lockdown number two, and we're you know Christmas shopping, holiday shopping, the holiday season. There's there's a ton of people that you know in this city that are going to have to be buying online. Absolutely. And, I mean, I'm moving to uh so i live in a condo right now but i'm moving to a house and me and my girlfriend haven't lived in a house for over i don't know you know four years you know and it's going to be a different situation when ubers are coming you know packages are coming over to you so i i kind of wanted to know you know from your perspective what what precautions should we all be taking you know uh, i guess to to um stop any of these porch pirates i love that term by the way it's all you porch pirates get off my porch um because i will be pissed off with my 9.99 apple cord for my phone gets stolen and i need it the yeah. next day <laughs> which everybody does for prime um but you know what what can we do what are those things we can do yeah the, the the best thing to do uh if you're moving into a home if you've gone from that you know concierge that you know is always there to accept those packages then um this this is a twofold thing is get to know your neighbors 
Because if you've mm. got a, a nice neighbor that is home, working from home or, or something like that, then if you trust that person, you can get the package delivered to them. If you can plan the package deliveries, you know, with, with Amazon Prime, it's guaranteed by, you know, by the weekend. So if you're starting to order Thursday, Friday or something like that, and it's coming next day, then, then you're good and you're home. Another thing that Canada Post has is Flex Delivery. And Flex okay. Delivery, it's a free program. Uh, what it does is uh, when you're getting stuff through Canada Post, they'll actually deliver it to the post office. And then you can just oh, okay. go to the closest post office, you sign up for it, and then you can go there. So, um, but getting to know the neighbors, it, it'll protect your house in general. If you're, if you're out to work and you start to get to know those neighbors on either side of you across the street, then they're watching your place. And statistics have shown that they'll call police if they see someone suspicious around your property. And yeah. then when you get to know them, they get to know you, you can have a, del- a package delivered to that, you know, that nice uh, old lady or retired man that's, that's sitting at home and they'll keep the package for you and they'll be happy to, to hold on to it for you. See everybody, Mrs. Johnson down the street isn't much of a hassle now when your package is about to get stolen by a porch pirate. So <laughs> That's right. thank you, Dan. <laughs> It's uh, it's true. You're, you know, you're right. And, and it's, it's a community that you live in. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's so true. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really think about it like that. Because again, when you're stuck in a condo for so long, you're just like, it's easy concierge is there. Um, and I think that even goes down to even, you know, more things, which is walking home, you know, that at least the condo where I was at was um, uh, Harbor and Bay, which is so lit financial district, Yeah, you know, tons of security there. Mm-hmm. Um, to a place now that will have less of that. So for, for all of us that are transitioning, you know, to maybe more of the inner city or more north where there's less maybe light, you know, at night, what's your thoughts on, um, I guess, our own personal safety when we're walking alone or things like that from, you know, ages of, you know, young adults to your, your high school students? Yeah, the, the first thing uh, that I will say, if you can avoid it, uh, avoid walking alone. Uh, walking with somebody is just that second set of eyes. It's that second person to call in the event of, of anything. You know what I mean? Even if it, you know we're getting into the winter, if there's a slip and fall, it'd be nice to have that person beside you in case your phone goes you know, flying out of your hand and out of reach when you when you fall. Yeah, because I uh, see my feet usually when I fall, and then in that second in time, I know it's it's over. So yes, yeah, somebody would be right. great to have there. <laughs> yeah, and and but that's not that's not necessarily realistic. And I'll, I'll give a number of tips. But one thing I like to say is is have balance. Um, Because before I I give a bunch of tips, I don't want people thinking that, you know, I want you, you dressed up as this, uh, this ninja warrior with a sword and, and, you know, scary eyes looking at everybody, right? There's balance here when we, when we talk about personal safety, but uh, when you're walking um, with that phone, if you, if you can't put the phone away, um, you know what I mean? Don't have your face buried in that phone, playing a game or something, you know, listen to a podcast, 24 shades of blue, just listen and walk, right? Absolutely. (laughs) And then, and then with that, you know, when you are listening to something, and if you are listening to something, great, but keep one, one headphone out, one earbud out so you can hear not only for your own safety and, and people around you, but also for traffic, because that's yes. one of the, the worst things. Faces buried in the phones, earbuds in, oblivious to, to anything and everything around you, and that's just, that's not safe. And Absolutely. I've done that before. I've made that mistake because I have the, um, the AirPod Pros with the noise canceling, and then... You don't, you can't even hear that car, you know, coming up, you know, quickly, especially if you're buried in your phone, which very guilty of. And I've been learning to unclick that noise canceling, look up, you know, just to see and uh, get my safe, my, myself out of my work and, and just keep going. So, you know, I, I think a lot of us need that reminder, um, um, especially just walking in general. Uh, it, it's, it's nerve wracking. I think, I think now when it's cold too, you're, you're doing your hot step and you're trying to be quick or, you know, you might be in a bad mood. Um, but you know, in, in these events that, um, you know, you feel unsafe, you know, what are the things we should be doing? You know, if we don't feel like it's a, you know, right place to be, what should we do instead? You know, instead of, should we call somebody? I don't know what, what should that work like? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we are the Toronto police will, will answer the phone every time you call. Right. And, and if you are scared or worried at, at, at any point, um, I, I think every police officer would tell you call. Because we would all rather uh, show up and have it turn out to be nothing, uh, mm-hmm. than show up and or not get called and show up have to show up after the fact, right? Uh, my, myself, crime prevention. That's that's my goal. We want to prevent crimes. So if if it means, hey, I'm walking down, I'm a little scared of of something. It feels like there's a car that's been following me a little bit. I'm nervous. Uh, call police. Sure. 
if it's not an emergency, we have that non-emergency number. Uh, you know what I mean? That you can you can call, and we can prioritize it that way. If you are legitimately scared, um, then then call police. If you can duck into somewhere safe, you know, a coffee shop or something like that, or or go back home, uh, replan the route. Even if you're walking somewhere and you're like, this is a little bit hinky, um, don't do it. And then if you're doing the same route over and over again, um, oftentimes we, we want to say, if you're going to the same place over and over again, then maybe change the route every once in a while. Just shake it up a little bit, just Got in it. case, you know? Yeah, for sure. So everybody call Dan 647. I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's I don't right. have his... <laughs> 911, you call and ask for me. <laughs> if you, t- you ask for Dan Ramos that's and he'll, <laughs> he'll be right there with a the beard for you. That's no, that's great. I, I actually didn't know that either. You know, when I was in university, I went to a University of Toronto Scarborough um, and my, my, my girlfriend went to York. Um, and I know there's a lot of those uh, walk services with you that they had. And, um, yeah. you know, from from the public standpoint, I actually did not know that that was a thing um, just for in your regular day life. So um, that's good to know, because there there's definitely times where, you know, we feel very you know unsafe in specific parts of the city. Um, but you're right. You know, switching it up. Um, very great tips. Um, but you, you actually brought something up earlier when we were off the record, uh, you know, pre-planning and talking was relay theft. And I had no idea, like, is this high? And could you describe what relay theft is first? And tell me about some numbers if you have them. You know, I would love to know, um, you know, how common it is. Yeah, I, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have specific stats okay. on it. But um, what relay theft is, is um, people are coming up to to your house, uh, typically, when the car's parked out front and they're, they're capturing the signal from your card or your key um, for your vehicle and they're relaying it to somebody who's standing by the vehicle and when they steal the signal from your key or card in your house, they send it to the vehicle and then what they can do is unlock your car. If it's a push button start, they push push the car button, it starts up and then they steal your vehicle without ever having to, to actually physically grab a hold of your keys or break into your house. Wow, that's... Um that's some black mirror stuff right there, you know, well, like current black mirror stuff, because, you know, that's, that's, um, that's something we all really don't think about. You know, we, we kind of rely on the fact that, oh, our cars are safe and, 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 and such and such, but especially when we're you know, remote starting and, and everything like that, that's a very susceptible technology is not perfect, everybody. So I, I hope we're all listening to, to Dan's advice here because, um, I, I've seen things more from a parking standpoint where people are swiping parking passes and, you know, staying, you know, from afar and, and grabbing it, you know, with a scanner and, and, and things like that. But I didn't know to the extent that, you know, for cars, it, it was uh, that heavy. Um, do you, do you uh, what do you usually do? You know, let's say that happens, you know, you just go on to the case and they try to figure out how it's stolen. But is it, um, is it, are, are people usually surprised when it does happen? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard uh, from, from one person say, uh, I think they were having their coffee and they heard the car door open and thought, oh, that's odd. That sounds really close. And it turns out it was their car. And then the car starts oh. up. They heard the car door close and then they go out and it's literally minutes later. And it's, wait a minute, that's, m- that's my car driving away. And they still have their keys with them. The house was never broken into. Um, and that's a terrible feeling when, you know, you're having your morning coffee, getting ready to go to work and, and to watch your car drive away without you. Do you have a name for those? Is it like Relay Rascals? You know? <laughs> oh, that's great. Coined. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. Let's use it. Yeah. Hashtag right. Relay Rascals. TPS. Listen to that. Relay <laughs> Rascals. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, the other thing I would love to talk about is, um, you know, can we find these tips somewhere um, on online, you know, uh, any resources? Yeah, we've got we've got a ton of resources. One of the, the biggest things we have is is pamphlets. And we used to set up in in pre COVID, of course, you know, set up with in malls in different places to to let people know about this stuff. And we've got over 32 pamphlets of a variety of things, everything from uh, auto theft, you know, home safety, personal safety, walking to, to even babysitter safety and taxi safety. So um, those we have available electronically as well as as physically. And so each division in Toronto has a crime prevention officer, at least one, or a community relations officer. So if you call into your specific division, you can ask them. They've got access to these pamphlets and they can get you the electronic copy. They can give you the, uh, the hard copy and then you can share it with friends, families, uh, neighbors and educate yourself right on, on how to keep yourself safe. Amazing. Amazing. One of the things I want to know about you, Dan, is more about you. Um, you know, you look like a great guy. You have a nice smile. You have a great beard. I, I like to talk to everybody, you know, when I spoke to uh, the chief, when I spoke to Hank, what is that reason that made you start 
you know, to be in law enforcement and to do this and go this specific niche also in law enforcement, what was it, you know, that inspired you? Uh, great, great question. This is this is something I think is sort of ingrained in my blood. I've got two other brothers that are in policing as well. So uh, I think it, it came from our father, who was, who was never a police officer. He was actually, um, he was hearing impaired. So he was deaf, um, so couldn't be a police officer. But I think there was something inside of him, I think, that would have been a cop if, uh, if he could hear. Um, and so that kind of passed down to my brothers and I and, and growing up with you know, four people in the house, four boys in the house and my poor mother uh, having to deal with all of us and all the craziness. I think we got into that, you know, initially as a kid, it seems cool. You know, you want to drive the cars, wear the cool equipment, you know, lights and sirens and all of that. But as we grew up and then I served in the army and thought, hey, this is this is a wonderful time to serve. And then to, to get into policing, my older brother got in first and, and and told us about how great it was. He was he's down at 14. He's a Toronto police officer. And uh, he sort of shared that, uh, that ignited that fire that I had as a kid. I was like, yeah, this is this would be a great job. And, and the more I, I've, I've gotten into it, the, the better it seems as I get older, you know, uh, for my kids wanting to make this a, a better place, you know, and being able to serve in, in, in with the Toronto police is, uh, has been just amazing, you know, and it's still, it's still a lot of fun. It's still a lot of, co- a lot of cool stuff we get to do and see, um, you know, a lot of scary stuff at, at some times, but it's, it's satisfying, right? It's, it's rewarding to, to go out and do these things. Troop is per prime example to get to do that and uh, and to camp with these these kids that would normally get another chance and to talk with with a police officer and share their concerns openly you know what i mean to to help somebody maybe prevent one crime that's great like i, I feel like you know if somebody's listened to this and and has done something that would prevent one or two crimes that's great you know we're, we're helping people they're feeling better they're living better right Absolutely. I love that's the fact that, you know, you want to do this. It, it's a, a selfless act. You know, you want to help people. You want to see people be safe, you know, feel safe. Um, and, and those are the main things I think we all want for everybody else, you know, uh, around. And, um, you, you know, going back to to you growing up, you know, with your brother and like you guys love, you know, I guess uh, cop stuff. What's your favorite cop movie? Oh, good question. Oh, yeah. Hard one. I know. Do you know what? I'm gonna give you your top two, because there's always a tiebreaker for, for what I usually hear. Yeah. So for me, it, it's, I've, I've had a difficult time watching cop movies now that I'm a cop because it's like that, that, really? doesn't feel that way. Yeah. So I, I critique shows and movies. So I've, I've stopped watching those. those <laughs> like that's not true. That yeah, doesn't happen. Right. I would never be allowed to blow up a car and be okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, Police Academy, I know it's, it sounds weird, but uh, Police Academy as a kid was just so funny, um, just amazing. I thought that they were they were absolutely hilarious. And then um, The Wire is a is a wonderful show on HBO. The Wire, yeah, that was. I mean, that was incredible. You have some solid choices there. These are some <laughs> solid choices. A, they are prime. I think they're two different sides of the spectrum. You know what I mean? They really are. They're like totally different sides, but they're both like the best of their spectrum sides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's that's cool. I, you know, I always like to hear that. I've noticed that. I feel like that's always become, you know, a thing. Whenever you watch it, it's always glorified in Hollywood. It's always glorified on the big screen and embellished for entertainment. And then, you know, you get into the force and, and you see, um, you know, what the reality is of, of the job. And, you know, did that ever... Did that ever disappoint you? You're like, oh, it's not like big Hollywood. But, you know, from what you told me, you know, you, you get the feeling of, of of being happy and from from helping people. But was there anything where you're like, OK, this is this isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I'll say maybe my my uh, my writing skills uh, were, were never great when I when I first got on. And yeah, the, the amount of paperwork required, oh. you know, every every minute of fun stuff is is an hour of paperwork. You know what I mean? So um, that's something that uh, I heard going through it. But but you never truly understand until uh, until you get on the job. You're like, wow, another form, yeah. another, you know, book I got to fill out, another report to do. Yeah. So. That's everything, though. That's everything. Like this show right now, you know, a lot of people don't know the amount of paperwork we had to do, the amount of planning and everything. Um, but the, the most of this interview for everybody to know is not planned. I like to keep it fresh. I like to hear what Dan says, um, what his beard says to us. Um, but would love to also know, you know, you, you spoke about your kids and, and you're, you know, your young dad with young kids um, and especially with everything that happened over the summer, all the protests. You know, how how are you communicating 
you know, those things because, you know, when I look at things, at least for me, I see there's always good people and there's always bad people. And, you know, there's and that's what it is for any profession. And I want to know how you kind of uh, define that between, um, you know, between those lines and and communicate that with your kids because you, you don't want them, you know, hearing things that might not be true, but also want to know, want them to know things that are true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, it's been interesting. Um, and to, to have those, those conversations to, to let them know, I mean, uh, growing up, they're still fairly young. So, so to them, uh, you know, daddy is the the strongest and and best person in the world. Right. And so, uh, they're starting to super powerful. I will always think that of my dad, no matter what he's over there, but he (laughs) can, That's right. So it, to, to show them that, uh, you know, hey, dad, daddy's not perfect. Uh, daddy makes mistakes and they're, not every police officer uh, is, is necessarily good. There, there are bad police officers. We are a part of the community. And to understand and to see them process that at a, at a young age and think, well, wait a minute, you told me police officers are good. And I said, yeah, they, they are good. But, but police officers are, are people too, right? They're, they're humans. They make mistakes. And so um, there are good people. There are bad people. There, there's there's good cops and there's bad cops. And to to see them grow and and, and struggle with that has has been good. And to to have those questions asked, um, especially my daughter is a little bit older, to ask those questions. You know what I mean? Like, what does this mean? What's happening here? Yeah. Right? And then to say, well, you know, we, we haven't always done it right. We haven't always been perfect, and we need to grow and and to change. And so we need to learn lessons just like she is. And so that, that's amazing. I, I think those conversations are so needed. And I, I think it's it's really the subject of humanizing people behind the title of their job, regardless of what that profession is. You know, we should all be accountable for what accountable for what we do. But, you know, at the end of the day, like you said, it's these are people that can make mistakes and we have to acknowledge that fact. So, you know, um, I, I think what you're doing as a father is, is amazing, Dan, you know, telling your kids that you should be proud of yourself. I'm sure your kids are like, daddy's the best, yeah. um, you know, and he's going to be the lumberjack dad to their, to their minds. That's a superhero. So that, that's really cool. Um, you mentioned your brother was in 14th division. Uh, I know they were on the ground, uh, during the protests and stuff like that. So I, I would love, and were you ever, we got sent out. Um, I got sent to 14 divisions. So uh, when I was in the office early on in COVID, um, we got sent out onto the road. So I got sent to, to 52, which is sort of the, the heart of downtown, uh, yeah. working with, with B Platoon, a uh, great, great group of guys, uh, 52B. Uh, still love you guys. Still miss you. Um, they were awesome. And so we were there with, with the protests. Um, the crew, the 52 crew took care of most of that. And so that was great. And so, yeah, we, we experienced a lot of that. My brother and I, on the road. I was only out there for about eight weeks and then um, things sort of, they didn't need us anymore and, and brought me back to the office to do this again. So. Got it. How was, how was that atmosphere? How was the atmosphere of being out there? Like uh, it looked tense. I, I mean, I wasn't um, out there. I, I did drive by and see everybody there. And it, you know, from what I saw, it looks like things were handled, you know, well, uh, especially what I've heard when I spoke to Shauna about everything before, I just want to hear it from your end. You know, what was that like? Uh, in the, I guess the interactions with everybody was that, really heavy for you and and how did you deal with that you know after you took off the tie after you took off the uniform how did you 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 yourself deal with all that yeah for for me i i'll be honest um being in in pru at 52 i didn't see a lot of uh of the protests i wasn't there on the front lines of the protesters but just dealing with with radio calls uh i i hear it from both sides i i hear people that were were still angry and still mad and and didn't like anything i said or did uh, and think I was wrong. And then I had a, a, a number of, of citizens say, you know what, we, we support you guys. We think you guys are doing a great job, you know, and things like that. So, um, so it was, it was humbling for sure to, to see both sides of it. And, and that's the job of policing, right? We can't make, we can't make everybody happy. Um, and we ha- but we have to understand that we're not perfect either. We've got to grow and we've got to see when, when we've made mistakes and, and learn from that. So it was, it was great. It was a really humbling experience to get back out there. And uh, especially in that time. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome, you know, that, that you know, you really did your part in, in, in making sure you, you're, you know, keeping everybody calm and everybody with the situation was calm and taken care of. So, you know, we appreciate, you know, you doing that. Um, one of the things I also wanted to know was, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I want to go back to that. What, how do you, how do you, t- you know, do you take all of that home with you? Do you try to leave it all at work? I know some of it stays with you, um, but uh, from what I've spoken to a, a lot of people on the force, you know, they've seen things that, the public would never ever hear about. 
um, because that doesn't make the news sometimes. Um, and how do you personally deal with it uh, when you go home? And also, how does the force deal with it, you know, for everybody that, you know, is dealing with it? You know, what what, what measures are, are taken to deal with mental health in the force? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a number of, of resources available um, for every officer uh, as far as uh, within the service, with our, our service uh, psychiatrists, to the association connecting with them and the resources they have, to Toronto Beyond the Blue, um, Boots on the Ground, and, and things like that. They've got a, a number of, of resources for us. For me personally, uh, I think I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing. I don't know if it's a, just because I've got a bad memory. <laughs> so, you know, um, <laughs> That'll help. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, and then it's, it's also, um, there's, for me, it, it's got to be a belief and a hope. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, right? And I've got faith in, in God and, and Jesus Christ as my Savior. So um, I know whatever's happening, you know, I can keep my faith in Him and something outside of, of the world and the situation, the circumstance. Because if you, if you start having, to me, if you start having faith in circumstances and they don't get better, then you could get yourself spiraling into a really bad place. So um, for me, that's, that's how I've done it. I've managed to keep a, a pretty optimistic outlook in a lot of things. And, and that's, you know, by God's grace, I guess. That's amazing. I'm glad you're, you know, using, you know, your prayer to, to help you with that because um, not everybody has that ability to reach to faith you know, I know other people use other things, uh, whatever it is, it's meditation, it's counseling, what have you. But I think regardless, everybody needs to to have something there to to, I guess, either release all that energy or, you know, find the confidence and hope because uh, it's it's a crazy time right now. We're in a pandemic yeah. and <laughs> it's just crazy to think about. I was reflecting on it a couple of days ago. I was like, wow, we all have masks. Almost everybody in the entire world has a face mask as of right now. And um, it, it's a crazy time, you know, in, in 2020, moving to 2021. It's going to continue season two for sure. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 like you said, I think we all need to handle it. Um, are you seeing, you know, a lot of, uh, I guess, officers deal with it differently? You know, I, I, you have faith. Do you see what other officers are doing Um and is it helping them? Like, do you see it the entire force being okay with their mental health or is it kind of like in the middle? What does that look like? Yeah, um, I don't get to speak to, to everybody, but um, from from the guys I've spoken to, uh, we we all understand. Um, it's, it's not that stigma that, that people talked about before, right? We all get it, that there are those that struggle and deal with, with situations differently and some internalize it and, and, you know, go over it in their minds and think, you know, what could I have done differently or, or something like that. Um, so we get it and we, we understand, and there is that support network in, in my office at the community partnerships and engagement unit. Um, we've had some great conversations. We had a, a guy from our equity inclusion, um, Ty, I don't, I don't remember your name, your last name, Ty, but uh, he came and gave a great presentation on the, the anti-black racism. And then it, it was a great presentation. But then after the fact, there was a lot of conversation going on in the office, right. And, and people opening up about stuff and, and their concerns and their struggles and, uh, and things like that and, and growing together, uh, you know what I mean? And talking about that mental health piece of it as, as well and how we can, we can grow. I mean, in, in our office, uh, we've got the, the mental health coordinator, um, Sergeant August Bonomo, this guy's a, he's a fantastic resource. And, uh, so he's somebody that, uh, that, that really knows his stuff him and his team are, are fantastic. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, I'm glad to hear, you know, that everybody has that open dialogue. There's measures being made, not just, you know, from a mental health, but, you know, um, from um, di um, diversity and inclusion. Uh, those are those are huge, huge things. And, uh, you know, we're happy to see that things are progressing. Um, is there anything, you know, as we're wrapping up here, is there anything you want to say, especially from the department that you work in that maybe the public doesn't know and uh, should know? Uh, um, if I could, if I could do maybe a quick uh, blurb on home safety, you're, you're about to move into a, a house. Um, yes. here's, here's the top two tips. If, if you want to make your house, uh, I'm ready. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'll say is, is always make it look like somebody's home. So, uh, whether you're home or not, it, as long as it looks like someone's home, most burglars will, will move on. They want that crime of opportunity. They don't want to engage with people. So, um, that's also to say, if you are home, don't shut off all the lights, you know, sit in the basement with your headphones on playing your video game, make it look like there's, there's somebody homing around because they, they may break in if you are home, but you don't look like it. Should I be doing the home alone, like cutouts that, that, that move in? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I, I've, I've used that in my presentations. I said, you know what, if, if, 
if Macaulay Culkin or uh, what's his name, Kevin McAllister, if the, if Kevin McAllister just did that every night, Harry and Marv would have just drove up, said, "Oh, another party," and and left, right? And then mom and dad would have shown up, no issues, right? Dan, you be- you and I were gonna have a startup idea. It's projected people. It'd be one right. of those light there things. So dragons, yeah. then people. I hope you all hear us. <laughs> Invest. So that's our idea. Continues. Sorry about that. No worries. Continue. That is, the only other thing for home safety too is is a dog, right? If if again, if Kevin McAllister got a big barking dog from the pound, and you know Harry and Marv knocked the first time and heard the dog, they would have left and they wouldn't have come back. So um, those are those are the things. And then the other thing I'll say is is balance, right? Be aware of your surroundings. Be uh, cautious, but but don't overdo it. Don't don't panic. Right? We live in a safe city. The city of Toronto is is a is a wonderful city. You know what I mean? Uh, most people, by and large, are pretty good. So, uh, but take some measures to protect yourself, and yeah, you should be good. And connect Amazing. with us if you have any questions. Amazing. We'll put a number down, everybody, in the description of the podcast that you can call if you're ever feeling unsafe. We're going to make sure that's there. Uh, but Dan, thank you so much for this talk. Beard and protect. Follow him on Twitter. Um, thank you for the conversation. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Axel. It's great. You're welcome. 24 Shades of Blue out.